On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA pulls SLS back to the repair bay, SpaceX equips Mechazilla for a booster catch, and Orbit Fab announces an orbital gas station. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. Try as they might, NASA just can't seem to get the space launch system working. On Saturday, September 3rd, the Artemis 1 launch was again scrubbed, this time due to a large hydrogen fuel leak from the quick disconnect system between the rocket and launch tower. After some meetings, NASA technicians have decided it is safest to do the hard thing and remove SLS from its launch moorings and bring it back to the VAB for concentrated repairs. This frustrating cancellation comes at the end of a frantic attempt to find a way to get the SLS to launch after a scrub was called the previous Monday. Since the scrub was called on August 29th, NASA had stayed positive, saying that they would continue for the weekend launch windows. Tex worked the issue with the engine number three and found that the problem wasn't actually the bleed line, but a faulty temperature sensor, meaning Engine 3 had likely been fit for launch the first time around. An annoying find, but it seemed to raise confidence as NASA scheduled a series of windows, starting with Saturday the 3rd of September, all the way through the following Monday and Tuesday. But when fueling started, another big problem appeared. At this point, we're all used to stories about SLS going well, and then something going wrong usually with the fuel systems, and it's not NASA's hardware or technicians that are the core of the issue, it's the fuel itself. SLS is based on older shuttle hardware, and so uses the same fuel, cryogenic hydrogen. This leads to two fundamental physics-based problems. This is that hydrogen is the smallest molecule on the periodic table, and NASA techs have time and again found that if hydrogen fuel is good for anything, it's finding leaks. If there is any wiggle room at all, you can be sure hydrogen will find its way out. This leads into the second issue, which is that cryogenic fuel has a tendency to change the shape of the fittings it travels through. This isn't unique to SLS either. Every vehicle that uses supercooled fuel has to deal with fittings moving around as they shrink and enlarge at the whims of thermodynamics. This is why NASA never really seems bothered by a small leak here and there. They know it's going to happen, whether they want it to or not. The problem begins when they can't get the fittings to reseat. And that's exactly what happened on Saturday. After the leak was discovered, Tex slowed, then stopped the fueling process to allow the fittings to warm up and reseat. Now, to be fair to the techs, this procedure normally works. We've seen it happen in real time during other tests. And we won't likely know what exactly caused the leak to become unmanageable in this situation until the techs crack SLS open and get a good look. And NASA has said basically the same thing during their press conferences, stating that no one root cause could be ascertained at the moment. Which is one of the reasons the hard choice to send SLS back to the VAB for repairs was made. The soft components of the quick disconnect systems will likely have to be replaced, as extended use on the pad during the Artemis 1 launch attempts has likely ruined them. But the technicians also need time to work through the checklist of possible issues, a common best practice for engineering that involves going through each system one by one until the solution is found. But some of that work could certainly have been done on the pad, and with other launch windows being present for the following days, NASA's decision really comes down to two factors, the Florida weather and the battery for the flight termination system. We've talked before about how bad the Florida weather is for rockets. The humidity gets into controlled spaces, including fuel tanks sometimes, and causes a huge amount of issues the longer something remains on a launch pad. Fixing the SLS under these conditions was considered, but ultimately, the corrosion and the chance for moisture getting into delicate components was deemed too big a risk, and rightly so. 
We've seen other companies face the same issue and make similar choices. But the big issue was the batteries that power the flight termination system. Every rocket that flies from a NASA pad has an FTS system. These things are a collection of sensors, fuel valves, ignition cutoffs, and various explosive devices that are meant to safely dispose of a rocket should the worst happen and the launch show failure conditions after liftoff. These systems close off fuel and ignition sources and then blast the rocket into smaller, safer pieces, and they're designed to survive almost anything. To achieve this, they are not only powered by the rocket itself, but have a dedicated battery backup. With this many days on the pad, that battery was getting into the danger zone of its lifespan, and while NASA could push into this allowable time, it's risky. And at this point, NASA is pretty far into a already risky situation to be poking Murphy's Law anymore. Rolling back to the VAB means the SLS is grounded for a couple of weeks at least, pushing the launch date of Artemis 1 potentially into October if they can solve the fuel leak issue. It's certainly hard to be optimistic about SLS at the moment. A failure like this, with this many eyes on the NASA team, has invited tons of criticism about how the agency is handling this program. And there's definitely lots to talk about there. But it's not like public opinion can make a rocket fly. At the end of the day, if a piece of tech is broken or operating dangerously, a group of technicians are just going to put their heads down and work the problem until it's done. We wouldn't want SLS to fly dangerously, even if it managed to get up there. Relying on luck is what puts astronauts in harm's way. No one knows that lesson better than NASA. So Artemis 1 can wait. We're going to get back to the moon with or without SLS. In brighter news, SpaceX have been continuing with their Super Heavy and Starship testing. Over the past few weeks, since all eyes were on the SLS Booster 7 and S24 have both had testing done, from pressurization and venting tests to full-on static fires for Booster 7. The latest static fire of B7 involved multiple Raptor 2 engines for the first time, and though one of those engines aborted, the rest fired just fine. The slew of testing seen at Starbase Boca Chica has been continuing at basically the same pace throughout August. Booster 7.1's tank was tested on the Can Crusher device, nose cones for S25 and S26 were tested in various construction phases, and work was done on both Boca Chica's launch tower and the tower at Pad 39A at Cape Canaveral in Florida. And that's the interesting part. While work is nearing completion for Florida's tower with the 7th, 8th, and top cap segments being spotted there, the Boca Chica tower got an interesting upgrade that we hadn't expected to see just yet, the arm actuators for the catch system. These actuators are used to allow the arms of the orbital launch tower to deaccelerate as it catches a super heavy booster and safely bring it to a stop. Super heavy is more or less capable of hovering, but the drop from orbit is bound to make the landing burn process be more than a little inaccurate. So the arms need these actuators to cover all the bases. And it's pretty unlikely SpaceX would risk the tower and its surrounding hardware on the first super heavy launch when so many unknowns are present. However, if a catch isn't part of the plan, then why attach the actuators? The key might lie in SpaceX's current launch cadence. By the end of August this year, SpaceX had launched 39 Falcon 9 rockets and is on track to reach about 60 by January. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk says the company is aiming for 100 rocket launches next year and has definitely talked about the accelerated launch cadence he hopes Starship will be able to achieve, in large part due to those arms on the launch tower. So if they are not going to attempt to catch the boosters on the first launch, then maybe the reason actuators are going on now instead of after the test is that they intend on testing a catch almost immediately afterwards, folding in a catch test with a test of how quickly the facility can handle repeat launches? That's definitely just some speculation on our part. Maybe the SpaceX team is just adding the actuators so they can test them as they keep testing the rest of their hardware, or 
maybe if the telemetry is just right on that first launch, they'll decide to go ahead with a test catch and just hope that it doesn't crash and explode in true SpaceX fashion. After all, they have a backup tower almost made and another one being planned. As usual, SpaceX can afford to break a few eggs. It's a staple of almost every sci-fi show and any discussion of orbital infrastructure. But so far, the idea of an orbital gas station for spacecraft has been only speculation. OrbitFab is going to change that. A startup from Silicon Valley, OrbitFab showed up in 2018 and has already done some testing of orbital refueling technologies for the ISS to prove the viability of their products. The whole goal of OrbitFab is to construct the orbital infrastructure necessary for humanity as a whole to really start operating in space for longer periods. And by focusing on the neglected or non-existent orbital refueling industry, they're really tackling the biggest obstacle to long-range operations. Most of a rocket's fuel is used just for escaping Earth's atmosphere. It's obviously dense and thick with gases that require a lot of force to push through. Gravity also plays its part, and so by the time a rocket reaches orbit, it's usually spent the majority of its fuel reserves. Once in orbit though, getting to another body is relatively easy and takes much less fuel. So what if a rocket could stop by a gas station once it completes its climb and replenish all of that potential thrust? Well. On August 30th, OrbitFab announced that they had a design that was essentially ready to go and the funding to make it happen. The plan is to send an orbital fuel depot into geostationary orbit with a little space gas truck shuttlecraft with an attachment called the Rapidly Attachable Fluid Transfer Interface or RAFTI. This interface would allow the company to refuel legacy satellites and orbital platforms in geostationary orbit creating what the company is calling a service lane. Focusing on geostationary orbit is a logical first step to prove the system, as it's stable and there are lots of satellites that were previously unable to get fuel up there. This system would immediately be able to supply hydrazine, a common fuel used mostly for maneuvering thrusters, to customers. But OrbitFab is already in talks to fit separate depots with fuel for other chemical and electric propulsion systems. Reportedly, rocket startup Astroscale has already announced a deal with OrbitFab to help with xenon refueling services. There's no telling how quickly rocket companies start designing their vehicles with rafty ports, but anyone without one is not going to be able to make use of all of this new infrastructure. OrbitFab is definitely smart to get into this industry before anyone else. The current price for refueling services from this depot is projected by OrbitFab to be around $20 million for up to 100 kilograms of hydrazine, which is how you know the company is actually in the final stages of designing this station. The plan is to get it up by 2025, and while it won't immediately be able to resupply bigger rockets with the fuel they'd need to operate all their systems, it's really just a matter of time once the first depot goes up before someone funds another one that can handle methane or kerosene. This really is a major step to making us more stable in space. Someone had to be the first, and OrbitFab seems to be in the right place at the right time. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.